Hi, uh, my name is James Blair. I am part of the team that runs the developer infrastructure for the OpenStack project. Um, I'm not the person who was originally listed on this schedule. That was Monty Taylor, who uh, also helps run that team. Um, and he was called away to do something I assume is very, very important. Um, so he titled the, uh, the talk in this slot, Zul Yu, and I don't know if that was intended to be an expletive or not. I, I, have, I, I wrote a program called Zul, and I'm not sure really what he was trying to say with that talk. Um, but at any rate, I'm going to give uh, a talk with some very similar content about how we do continuous integration and how we run the developer infrastructure for the OpenStack project which of course is the answer to um, something that was uh, kept coming up in the previous talk, which is uh, the infinite number of tests uh, that one might want to run. Uh, you should run an infinite number of tests and you should do them on a public cloud, particularly if you can convince that public cloud provider to give you resources for free, uh, which is what we've managed to do. Um, so I'm not going to talk about OpenStack itself. Uh, there are um, several other talks at this uh, conference where you can learn about some of the components of OpenStack. Um, so while I'm not going to talk about OpenStack, let me tell you about OpenStack real quick. It's open source software for running public and private clouds. Uh, so um, think Rackspace public cloud, HP public cloud. Um, they're all running OpenStack. You can download the software yourself, run it on your laptop or the server farm that you run in your basement, as some of the people on our team do, uh, or uh, inside your own Fortune 500 company or whatever it is that you're doing. It's all the same software, um, same APIs. That's sort of the value proposition there. Um, and of course, that being the case, we tried to uh, eat our own eat our own dog food. So all of the, the infrastructure that we do for CI is run on uh, currently two uh, public OpenStack clouds. Um, so it's actually, we, we see it as, as, a, as a massive cross cloud uh, single application. Um, so, but a lot of what we do is driven by the complexity of OpenStack itself. Um, these, we, I'm gonna refer to it a lot uh, as, as a single project, and um, that's the way a lot of us like to think of it. But it's really composed of a lot of, uh, of individual software components, which are their own projects led by their, uh, their own groups of people with their own groups of developers, uh, their own Git repositories and everything. Um, so on the left, we have all of the servers that do things that you might want to do in a cloud, um, manage compute, uh, systems, storage systems, things like that. Uh, over on the right, under the uh, arrow, which indicates that they're very important, are the Python or the uh, client libraries. You'll you'll notice that they're all um, they're all in Python. Uh, OpenStack itself is all written in Python, uh, and so actually that's going to drive a, a, a bit of um, uh, of some of the decisions and some of the tooling that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, Really quickly, there's, uh, with a project of this scale, there are a number of uh, horizontal efforts and programs. Um, there's a documentation team. There's, there's a team that was formed specifically to identify um, bits of code that kept getting copied around to the other programs and refactor those out into separate libraries. Um, there's uh, a quality assurance uh, team, basically a, a team that, um, they don't, they don't do what, uh, what a QA team would normally do, which is sit there and run tests all the time. What they do is they try to make sure that all of the tests that other people are writing are working correctly. And when things go wrong, they, they help triage them. So the testing infrastructure here is, is large enough that we, while we expect everyone to, every developer to write and deal with the consequences of testing their own code, uh, we still need a team to sort of coordinate that effort. And that's what the QA team is for. Um, there's release management, uh, translations, vulnerability management, and of course, the infrastructure team, which runs all of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, here. Um, the, the release management uh, process, it, it impacts a little bit of what we do. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it in, in very much detail, but basically you need to know that we're on a six month timed release uh, cadence. Um, we, we make sure that uh, 
the tip of master is always runnable. Uh, there's actually a group of folks that are really interested in doing continuous deployment of OpenStack. Um, but we also, every six months, we uh, fork off a stable branch and uh, we maintain that for a while uh, with the help of the um, major Linux distributions. Uh, so I mentioned a project of this scale. Um, here's a little bit about that scale. We have um, contributors from a number of major companies. A lot of people uh, who work on OpenStack are actually employed to work on OpenStack. So as, a, as an open source project, um, you know, that, that makes, uh, that means it's a little bit different than, than you know, your kind of weekend hacking sort of uh, project. But uh, you can see some of the companies that are represented up there. Um, this, is, this is changing all the time. This is a snapshot from a little while ago. But it's, it's fairly re representative of the kind of diversity uh, that we get. We have you know, Red Hat and uh, HP and IBM all uh, collaborating on the software, which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, there's, uh, with that, that means that we have teams um, you know, working in, uh, in groups in these separate uh, companies all over the world. Uh, so as a project, one of the things that we have to do is to try to uh, unify these teams and, and help these people work together as if they were all on the same team. Do you get these mm -hmm. um, corporate contributors trying to drag the project in different directions? Um, not, not really. Uh, I, I think so one of the things that we do is uh, we have the uh, design summit every uh, six months, and we get everybody in the room. Uh, and when somebody, you know, that, that really helps a lot with, like, I, well, I want I want this component to go in this direction. I want it to go this other one. So get everybody on the same page and hash that sort of thing out so that uh, so that you know what you're going to be doing in the next six months. Um, so that's that's worked pretty well. There are some OpenStack developers here in the room, and uh, if they disagree with that answer, feel free to, to uh, object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, since you've been doing so much work with the Neutron project, some of the projects uh, are, um, are are more open to different kinds of architectures. For for instance, the Neutron, the networking as a service project, it has to deal with all of these different um, companies, all of their different equipments. You know, it, it actually has to talk to lots of different switches, which means lots of plugins for different components. So in, in that project in particular, there's a, there's a huge amount of people working on their particular area. Uh, and so one of the challenges that we've been working with is, is how do we get, um, in, a, in a project that facilitates and is, is so geared towards that, how do we get uh, those people on the same page? And, I think yeah. it's no worse than in fact, maybe it's a bit better because uh, for each project, the group of people with the uh, approval rubber stamp is more than one person. And so those people have to reach a consensus about what goes in. So you do occasionally see stuff that would hurt everybody but one person. It's not normally intentional. It's more like, I haven't thought about your use case because I work in VMware. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then when you say, well, you know what, your code's not merging, people tend to come around and you know, make it more generic or whatever. Yeah, and that's um, uh, a really good point, which I really hoping segues into this, these next couple of slides, um, <laughs> which is um, sort of some of the tooling and the process that we have around actually uh, testing and merging code. So uh, to, to try to, to get everybody on the same page, um, we tried to do uh, development of tooling around development centrally. Uh, so um, when we have, we have tools to uh, help get your code into the code review system, uh, we have uh, tools around, um, you know, setting up uh, a test OpenStack system in order to do development to tests and things like that. We try to do that all um, centrally to, uh, so that people aren't sort of off in their corner um, working on cool little tools uh, that, you know, that, that actually everybody needs. Um, but uh, that, that kind of helps get people um, Treating this as a uh, 
as, as a project and a unified global team uh, when the onboarding process for a new developer is the same. So uh, no matter what company that you're working with, um, in, you know, in order to contribute code to the process, uh, to the project, you're going to use the same process and the same tools and things like that. And so um, one of the things that we do is, is to, try to, uh, to try to make that, um, that process simple for everybody, no matter where they're coming from. Um, and to elaborate a little bit on one of the things Michael was getting at, which is uh, the, the code review process. It's very important to what we do, and um, uh, customarily, uh, every patch needs to have uh, a sign-off from at least two core reviewers on the team. And the core, the core review team is uh, um, uh, actually maintaining and growing that is seen as a, as a really important uh, activity for the project. Um, so core reviewers need to identify potential new core reviewers and help bring them into the team and things like that. And so with this team that's made up of uh, people from, uh, uh, again, lots of different companies working on it, um, I think that really uh, helps as well. Um, so this, uh, th this is the set of developer infrastructure that we run, at least as of the last time we updated this slide. Um, and um, you know, there's obviously a lot of this stuff, especially up in the top left-hand corner, uh, is uh, is square on into the, the the subject of this mini comp. It's all about um, developer, uh, about continuous integration and things like that. Um, but we we see a lot of these systems as integrated too. Uh, you know, even if they're a little a little further away from uh, continuous integration proper. You know, how how we actually integrate our code review system with our bug tracking system and things like that are all actually very important when you start treating uh, this as, as a whole. Um, so everything that we do related to all of those systems uh, is run out of a single uh, Puppet repository that's in Git and is publicly accessible. Um, and uh, we actually run the operations of the project developer infrastructure in the same way as the project itself. Uh, so again, uh, every change goes through code review. Uh, a couple people have to sign off on it at least. Uh, anybody can propose a change. Uh, if you, you know, propose a, a change to start running a new piece of software on a server, when we approve that change, it will just happen. Um, if you propose a change to spin up a new server, well, one, one of us will type in the commands to spin up the new server. Um, but uh, at any rate, it does all go through code review. It is all public. Uh, and that's actually uh, pretty cool. Uh, cool enough that uh, Elizabeth is giving a talk on that on Wednesday um, here at LCA. So if you want to dive into the mechanics of how we're doing that, um, I would encourage you to attend that talk. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the development environment for OpenStack is, uh, is in uh, Python. Everything, currently everything in OpenStack uh, is, uh, is a Python program. Uh, so a lot of our testing and a lot of our developer infrastructure is, is sort of uh, based around that. Um, uh, there are some of the specifics if you're interested uh, in, in, if you've got a, a Python project. Uh, we've found it useful to target a a couple of specific operating system variants. Uh, we uh, we use the we follow the PEP8 standard of uh, the Python style guide, uh, which actually turns out to be pretty important once you have about uh, uh, three three hundred active developers all hacking on project at the same time. Uh, things like indentation and whether you use spaces or tabs and where you put your parentheses. Uh, uh, actually becomes really important. Um, we have a whole bunch of uh, IRC channels. Um, there's, uh, we have general development channels. We have two meeting channels at this point, actually, that are pretty much booked solid. So you can just join OpenStack meeting at any time of day, and there will be some kind of official meeting for some project going on. Um, but that's part of how we run the, the governance of the project in a, in a really open manner. Uh, and of course, uh, we, uh, we run tests on newly contributed changes, which is what we're really interested in here. So uh, we do this thing called project gating, um, where we, we don't let a change land to, uh, the, to a branch 
unless it passes all of the tests that we have for that project or all of the projects even. So um, of course, you know, as a developer, it's a really good idea to run tests uh, after you write some code. Um, we uh, don't necessarily trust that everybody's going to do that. Again, with uh, so many developers, it's uh, nice to have computers do this for us. Um, but also, it's gotten to a point where running the tests for OpenStack is actually quite complicated. You can imagine that spinning up um, a cloud computing fabric controller uh, and running all of the integration test suite for that uh, might be a little bit complicated. It, uh, if, you, if you do it, it will consume a machine and you'll have to throw it away and never use it again. Um, so uh, again, that's a really good use of a cloud. Uh, so what we do is we, um, for, for every change, we spin up uh, a complete OpenStack instance, uh, run all of the integration tests on it, which take about 40 minutes. Um, and we do that several times for several different configurations. So uh, we actually, um, I think a change to Nova will, will uh, I don't know, spin up about yeah, five or six something uh, full OpenStack uh, clouds. And then we have a bunch of other tests that, that uh, like unit tests and style guide tests and things like that, that, um, that also run on them. Um, so anyway, the reason we do this uh, is, is to basically facilitate uh, collaboration among all of these developers and to, uh, and to make sure that the process is egalitarian. Going back again to uh, you know, if people wanting to take it in their own direction, um, if nobody's exempted from this process, nobody can push uh, a change uh, into, into Git without it passing these tests. Uh, nobody says, oh, I'm pretty sure it'll work. I'll just Git push it. Uh, that, that, that never happens um, here. So everybody's uh, subjected to the same process. And you know, as a developer, it's really handy because it means that when you start your day, you, uh, you, know, you can check out the latest copy of the code and you know that it's still passing tests, at least. You know, it, that somebody didn't break it right before they went to bed uh, yesterday. And that's, you know, so that's generally not the first thing that you're going to have to deal with in the morning is fixing somebody else's code. Um, so just uh, here, here's a peek at our uh, status screen for, for Zool, which drives a lot of our project automation. Um, it's, it's titled Everything is Automated uh, because this kind of gives you a, an idea of all of the different kinds of things we're doing. Uh, over here uh, on the left in the, uh, the check pipeline is every, every time somebody uploads a change, um, it, uh, it starts running uh, tests for those changes. Changes. So here's a change to Nova, and it's running all of these uh, jobs uh, for that change. Over here in the gate, uh, that's the project gating system that I was uh, telling you about. It's, um, you know, people are actually trying to merge changes here. And, uh, and so once again, we run tests on those, and if, uh, if they pass, then these changes are going to merge. Um, but we also do a lot of other project automation through the same system. Um, we build tarballs, run coverage jobs, build documentations. Um, we build our release artifacts. Um, uh, we do translation imports and exports and things like that all through this system as well. Um, and uh, I'm gonna get into uh, a little bit more about that later. Um, so the process for a developer is, um, is, is pretty simple, but it's, it's kind of specific. You, uh, you, know, you, you clone a copy of a repository, you make some changes in your local environment, um, and, uh, and commit those changes. Uh, you push it to our code review system called Garrett, uh, using a tool that we wrote called git review. Uh, um, so that's actually kind of cool, because it's just one command. You know, you git commit, and then git uh, review, and it pushes up for code review. Uh, so once it shows up in Garrett, Jenkins starts running tests on it. Um, and when somebody, uh, uh, and then uh, reviewers come along and they review your change. And if they like it, they approve it for merging. And it goes back to Jenkins. And uh, if it passes tests, it gets merged into uh, the Git repository. Um, so one of the, the reasons that we run, you'll notice Jenkins is on here twice. Um, one of the reasons that we run tests uh, not only on upload, um, uh, that's to try to, to get 
uh, the, the test results in front of rev reviewers as quickly as possible. Um, but we also do it um, right before merging uh, because we have a lot of components, if you remember from that first slide, um, and they all relate to each other and uh, they're all moving very quickly. So even, even if your change passed tests when you uploaded it, something may have changed in either this project or some other project since then. Uh, and so we, we make sure to, to run that test again before we actually merge it. Um, the code review system that we use is uh, called Garrett. It is developed by Google for the Android Open Source Project. It's a standalone patch review system. Uh, and one of the neat things about it is it has uh, a lot of points that you can hook into for automation. Uh, you can do uh, queries against it uh, to get uh, JSON information back. You can uh, subscribe to an event stream and respond to things in real time. Uh, it can run hooks, like get hooks internally when somebody uploads something or it's merged. Uh, it has uh, extensible code review categories. So, so in general, it's just uh, really, uh, really flexible and adaptable to a lot of systems, which is why we've been able to hook it into all of those things that we run. Um, here, here's a... Uh, a screenshot of a typical review in Garrett. Uh, so when somebody goes to review a change, they can come and, and they can see the, you know, the git commit message on the right. Uh, over here at the bottom are the, uh, the votes from other reviewers. Um, so this, this change was fairly positively received. Um, there's a side-by-side -side diff view, uh, which uh, works out really well for, for actually tracking down um, you know, actually seeing what's changed. Uh, and you can do, it's not shown here, but you can do um, inline comments, line by line comments. Um, uh, so we have Garrett hooked up to Launchpad, which we use for bug tracking. Um, and you'll note here, here's an example of when somebody proposed a change to Garrett, our system automatically updated the bug in Launchpad and left a link back to Garrett saying, hey, somebody's attempting to fix this bug, uh, at least. And so that sort of facilitates people finding um, new information about uh, things when they're going and looking at bugs. Um, here's a screenshot of uh, reviews that it's slightly cut off here, uh, but you can you can see that um, you know Garrett has some some uh, sort of dashboard screens where you can see all of the reviews that uh, that have. You know that that have been approved or are awaiting review or things like that. Um, it's so it's actually pretty good for for managing uh, a workflow around development. Um, and I mentioned Git review earlier. Here's uh, here's what this looks like for a developer. Uh, if you um, commit a change, you know Git commit obviously right there, uh, and then you do. Uh, you just type git review and it pushes it up to uh, Garrett for review. And uh, once you start using a system like this, it, 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 it's really hard for me to use anything else now because it, just the idea that I can write some code and type this one command and it's all for review, and I could go write some more code um, is, is really attractive. Uh, so, when, so when does the push happen? Uh, git review does the push. So honestly, if, if you're familiar with git, it's, uh, it's a very simple around um, git push Garrett head colon refs for master. Uh, but we didn't want to tell a thousand developers to type that. So instead we wrote git review. It does a few more things. Uh, it's, it's a zero configuration kind of system um, where by looking at a dot git review in the git repository, it will know what Garrett server needs to be pushed to. And so it'll automatically, automatically configure the, the git remote for that Garrett server and things like that. Um, but um, yeah, so, so basically that one command is designed to do everything needed to interact with Garrett um, with, with no advanced preparation other than downloading and installing Git review, which is in um, Debian and Ubuntu and uh, Fedora. So you can, you can package manager install that for whatever distro you have. That's uh, that's that's a really what project is that? Okay, that's uh, that's a really clever idea. Um, we 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 don't we don't reject the pushes based on failures. We just try to uh, 
to get them into the system and start running the tests on them as quickly as possible. I, I think most developers at this point, or sorry, most reviewers at this point, probably just wait for those initial results to come back positive uh, before they really even start looking at a review at this point. Um, so uh, we run a couple of different kinds of tests. Uh, you can imagine we run unit tests, integration tests, things like that, different levels of complexity. Um, one of the things that I sort of glossed over earlier is when we're doing the, the project gating of changes, we're not just testing this change. We're, what we're trying to do is test the final effect of this change. What we're doing is testing when this, after this change lands, is the project still going to work? Which is a simple but subtle thing, especially when you start thinking about the idea that you might have a bunch of changes in flight. So we need to test that when all of those changes land, is the project still going to work? Uh, things like that. Um, uh, let's see. So we actually have a script called Garrett Git Prep, which uh, which does this for us. It um, it it depending on on what the proposed future state of the project is, Garrett Git Prep will download uh, all of the uh, it'll check out all of the Git repositories to the appropriate locations, uh, and uh, and then we can install uh, from there. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that where the rebase happens as well? The rebase? So occasionally you see a review that says, look, I couldn't rebase this current oh. state of master. Where's that? That's ac that actually comes from Zool. That's, that's mm -hmm. Zool's attempt to, to merge that change into, into master. So the ref that comes out of Zool is post-rebase? Yes. Or merge or whatever. But yes. Um, so uh, we have this thing called DevStack Gate. Uh, it's based on DevStack, which is a, a system that's uh, it's basically a, a series of shell scripts that set up um, uh, uh, all of the OpenStack components needed to run a cloud. Um, and uh, it's, it's how, we, uh, uh, how we set up all of those components and, and run the integrated, uh, um, integrated test suite. Um, a couple of the problems that we run into with DevStack um, are, are related to sort of the number of test runs that we do. We, we, we run tens of thousands of these every day. Um, and uh, it turns out that when you start doing that, relying on external services like PyPy or um, mirrors or things like that, uh, they can fail a lot. So one of the um, things that we do is uh, um, we have a system called node pool, uh, which will, uh, It'll take a cloud node. It'll uh, install all of the uh, dependencies needed for us to run our tests. Uh, it'll snapshot that. And then it spins up uh, test nodes on demand uh, so that we can run our Jenkins tests on them. And all of those nodes are, are based on, those, uh, on that snapshot so that everything's sort of pre-cached. Um, the, the engine that drives all of this automation is called Zool. Uh, it's a general purpose uh, project gating and project automated automation system. Uh, it's another piece of software that we wrote uh, within the OpenStack infrastructure project. It interfaces with Garrett and it says Jenkins, but at this point it's um, anything else you might want to uh, interface it with. There's at least one person in this room who has something that's not Jenkins uh, running tests um, uh, that's integrated with, with Zool. Um, it's really flexible. It's all configuration driven. Um, and it does this sort of mind-bending thing, which is uh, it tests a, 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 uh, a serialized queue of changes in parallel. And um, I don't have time to get into how that works at this talk, but uh, on Friday at 1040, um, I'm giving a talk on that uh, that focuses more uh, closely on Zool itself. Um, so these, these are the things that I'm going to skip over uh, and, and, and talk about at that other talk. Um, so we have, uh, I think at, at last count, do you remember how many? We have many, many hundreds of jobs in Jenkins uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, around the time that we, we had, we had about 80 jobs in Jenkins and we were managing them by going through the web interface and clicking on, the, on things a lot. Around the time we had 80 of those, we said this isn't going to work in the long run. And so we started writing a program called Jenkins Job Builder. Um, and it takes, um, we're really good at names. Uh, it takes uh, YAML files 
uh, that we keep in a Git repository, and it translates those into the XML that Jenkins uses. Um, so, and it's got a lot of templating system uh, built into it. So we, we can do things like say, here are all of the jobs that a Python project needs to have, and now instantiate all of those jobs for this Python project, and this other Python project, and this other one. Uh, and so, you know, with the combinatorials on that, we end up with many hundreds of jobs, but they're very easily managed because they're all uh, human readable YAML files in Git. And, uh, and of course, again, anybody can propose changes to them. Um, here's a quick example of a template in Jenkins Job Builder. Uh, so if you wanted to run a PEP8 job, that's the Python style checker, uh, you, you could say um, the name of this job is gate, insert name of project here, PEP8. Uh, run Garrett git prep to set up the Git repository, then uh, run the PEP8 uh, builder, which is defined elsewhere. Um, anyway, the, some, a lot of our actual configuration looks uh, nearly this simple, uh, and, and so it's really been able to, to help us scale that out, um, as well as make it more accessible for anybody to help pitch in and, and maintain this stuff. So, uh, so if we had that template and we wanted to apply it to the Nova project, that's what it would look like. Um, another really interesting thing that we've been doing uh, is, uh, again, because we, we run so many uh, test jobs for, uh, for so many projects, um, we have uh, all of those test runs generate quite a bit of log data. Uh, and so um, we've actually been dealing with the challenge of how do we present that to developers? When there's a, a failed test run for this massively complex system, how do we say, okay, here are the logs, figure out what happened. Um, and so we, we started by uploading them all to uh, you know, an Apache web server and said, here are the logs, figure out what happened. And being as there's 250 megs of them um, for a single 40 minute, oh, sorry, compressed, uh, 250 megs compressed in a single 40 minute test run, um, that didn't go over very well. So um, uh, Clark uh, Boylan, who's uh, here and also going to be talking about this on uh, Wednesday, I believe. Um, Friday? Crap, did I get it wrong? Maybe. I think it is Friday. Sorry. Um, Clark's going to be talking about this on Friday. Uh, um, he's been uh, leading a lot of uh, the development in this area, which is around how do we how do we present these logs to users? So we're using we're we're doing things like taking uh, all of the logs from all of the test runs, uh, putting them through Logstash. Uh, so that you can use Kibana to you know, search through them. Uh, we can do elastic search queries against the logs and, and say things like, well, when did this error message start appearing? Uh, and things like that. So it's, it's been uh, really useful. And it's actually, I think, a, a really interesting area to, of development. Um, and uh, finally, uh, while we try to do a lot of this testing, uh, in, in the context of the, the, the OpenStack project infrastructure, which as I mentioned, anybody can contribute and help out with. Um, sometimes that's just not feasible. We run all of our stuff on public clouds, which means that we, if you wanted to test how Neutron integrates with some Cisco router, um, we're not going to be able to test that. Uh, you're going to have to do that in a lab somewhere. And so we, we have a, a formalized system around third-party testing where uh, developers can uh, subscribe to the Garrett event stream. They get notified of new uh, new changes. Uh, they can run them on their own test rigs and in, in house and report the results back to Garrett. Uh, and, uh, and then that way, developers can see like, oh well, this uh, this change broke uh, Cisco switches. And then you know we're not gating on that, so you can decide whether or not you actually care if you broke a, a Cisco switch or not. But the information is there. And um, Michael Still is uh, one of the folks in our community who's uh, doing this. He's uh, specifically doing it around uh, database migrations, uh, uh, basically because he wants to test with production, production uh, information, uh, and he doesn't want to do that by checking in the production information into a public, public Git repository. Um, so uh, anyway, he'll be talking about that um, Wednesday, I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so anyway, uh, hopefully you can attend that one too. Um, these uh, slides, as well as many others, are all kept in a public Git repository that goes through code review and is automatically published through Zool. Um, and you can see them at docs.openstack.org info publications. 
Um, and do I have any time for questions? About 54 seconds. All right. Yes. So you mentioned that you have um, integration tests that take like 40 minutes to run. Yes. Um, so we've had the policy that if your test takes longer than a minute or so, it's probably too slow, and our developers don't want to wait more than two or three minutes to get mm -hmm. uh, an up or down for seconds. How do you guys even deal process-wise with the fact that you can but it takes like an hour before you know whether we did it before. Uh, work on lots of, uh, sorry, uh, to repeat the question. So uh, the, the, the question was, hey, if your tests take 40 minutes, um, why don't your developer, why do your developers even put up with that, uh, to paraphrase? Um, so uh, one, of, one of the coping strategies for that is to have lots of things going on at once. So push something up for testing, switch to work on something else, and you get your results back later. Um, another thing is uh, the unit tests can be run locally very easily and much faster than that. Uh, so of course, you know you can run the unit test for a project um, just on your workstation, and that should that should work fine and and um, be fairly quick. Especially if you do something like uh, uh, filter it down to just the tests in the area that you're working on. Unit tests are parallel. Uh, plus, the unit test, thanks to uh, this guy over here, uh, can be run in parallel. Uh, we use uh, test repository for most of the projects at this point. I think it's still an ongoing. Yeah. All right. Um, so, but then just going back to integration testing, one of the, one of the things that we're doing with that uh, is is we are spinning up an entire cloud. So there's there's a good ten minutes of just installing the software before we even start doing the tests. Um, so uh, honestly, given all that overhead, uh, a lot of developers are pretty happy with the idea that they don't even have to worry about that at all. And, and that in only 40 minutes, uh, this automated system will do all that for them and, and get the results back to them. But, but then again, uh, if you're actually doing development, it's likely that you, you might be doing it inside of your own uh, copy of DevStack. Uh, that already has a cloud spun up, right? So you might you might even be doing iterative, iterative development where you're editing a file and you start up the process and run it again and, and, and that. And if you're in that context, you can run the integration tests uh, locally as well. Uh, and again, using test repository, uh, uh, they run in parallel and they're they're actually pretty fast if you narrow it down. So so if you're down there in the trenches, you know you could you can you can run an individual test locally on your own system, and it should only take a couple of seconds. I think the other thing too there is the thing with Zool is at the end of those forty minutes, it will not only give it the plus two with latent, but so if it passes, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, of course. Course. yeah we we have the same thing except that it's, uh, people use. Zool as a, a, a surface to surface of their own agents. Because if all you're running in Zool is like, you know, JS hint and mm -hmm. documentation building and a couple other things, then it takes two minutes to run it all. And people just like submit code blindly without even running tests locally. Yeah. And then two minutes later, it, it comes back, well, this one unit test failed and you put a wrong comic here. And then they go, oh, well, they, they submit an amendment and they, they fix it. And then two minutes later, they get yeah, we, we, we used to uh, we used to be uh, get sort of frustrated with with people like that who who would waste the test resources on something that they could have run locally, uh, and, and we're like, hey, why are you so lazy? But then uh, once once the integration tests started taking forty minutes to run, and and the full suite of unit tests for Nova, I think takes around ten minutes or fifteen or something at this point. Um, we 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 just we lost that argument and, and 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 now we're happy to provide this public service uh, which will run these tests for you because hey at least you're running tests so. cool. you all right thank, thank you, you.